Today we're going to cover two films that you may or may not remember. I remember because I think I saw both of these in the theater. But they came out at a time when most people had not really been exposed to a lot of the conspiracy genre that we know so much about now. Especially after Jeff Stein Effrey. Uh, before I do that though, I want to say shout out to our friends uh, Melissa and Aaron at True Steam Stream Tuftweem. <laughs> Truth Stream Media, Truth Stream Media, because they sent me this badass Nicholas Cage T-shirt. It says, "Today I'm feeling bees, not the bees." Right? That's what it is. The bees, not the bees. So I want to thank them for that birthday Christmas present because my birthday is around the time of Christmas. So. That was an awesome uh, present from them. And shout out to Truth Stream Media. If you would, follow the, those guys and their great work that they do. Uh, friends of Jay's Analysis, for sure. Uh, but we want to talk about Hide and Seek. Not Hide and Seek. That's another one that I should have included in this in this collage. Here. We're going to do two, though. Uh, I didn't know there was enough in both of these films to do one whole video on each. So we're going to put two in one video. So Identity and Butterfly Effect, right? Now, Identity is 2003... Uh, you've got John Cusack here, who, oddly enough, often plays a limo driver or a hitman. It's like after Lloyd Dobler was Lloyd Dobler in Say Anything, he progressed into then becoming a hitman at some point, if you believe that Gross Point Blank is kind of a rough sequel to uh, Say Anything. And then uh, the movie War uh, is kind of a loose sequel, too. So there's these references, right, to, to Lloyd Dobler and his pen and... He's a, an assassin now, right? Uh, and there's even a mention that he works for one of the big families in the world, the biggest families, as an assassin. That's actually mentioned in, I think it's Gross Point Blank, yeah. Uh, which is a, a good movie, by the way. But we got Cusack here as this limo driver, and they all kind of happen into this seedy motel, him and a bunch of people. And the... Uh, I did want to point out one thing about the beginning of the film, Columbia. We know that Columbia Pictures, uh, she's always showing the the light of the torch of liberty because she's Lady Liberty. She is the uh, Luciferian image, actually. She's the enlightenment bringer of uh, knowledge. And then, so it's Columbia Pictures, and then actually Columbia is mentioned in the film. So I just thought, like, not too long after the opening sequence of Columbia, Columbia, South Carolina is mentioned in the film. And we noticed that it's, you think the movie does a pretty good job of kind of distracting you. And you think that the core personality uh, of this, of the situation, spoiler alert, right, is John Cusack. You think John Cusack is kind of the, pro, the, the protagonist and he's going through these weird events and phenomena and these seemingly supernatural things are happening at this seedy motel. People are disappearing. They're showing up as no longer there. They're, they're mysteriously dead and then they're gone. So what is happening? Well, there's a few clues here that I think key us off from the outset. When you go back and watch it, it's kind of clear. But if it's your first time watching the movie, spoiler alert, I don't want to tell you everything, but I'm going to here in a minute. Uh, I can't help it, right? But if you notice in the limo, he's got a book by Jean-Paul Sartre. Jean-Paul Sartre. Being in Nothingness by Sartre or Sartre depending on how pretentious you are and pretending to be some sort of philosophy snob. It's Nietzsche. It's not Nietzsche, dude. It's Nietzsche. It's not Sartre. It's not Sartre, dude. It's Zatra. Right? People do this online when they try to pretend like they're these aficionados. Anyway, Sartre's book, Being in Nothingness, is what John Cusack is reading. That's a curious book for a limo driver to be reading this giant fat rambling treatise about wearing masks and hiding behind masks and what's real and what's not real. What's a real person? Who's a real, who are we really? And are we all just wearing masks, right? This is the kind of stuff that Sartre and the existentials talk about. And in a lot of these esoteric films, we do see existentialism brought up quite a bit because they are kind of asking, even though they're anti-metaphysicians, they're asking metaphysical questions. They're asking questions about who are we really? Are we all just uh, playing a role and pretending to be somebody? There's not really a, a core personality there. And that's what is the key to unlocking this film, right? Which is, it's obvious by the end of the movie, but um, 
There's some curious things that are mentioned that if you go back and watch it, I never caught, which is that the hotel is a, an Indian burial ground. It's actually in the, the, the brochure at the hotel that it's buried on this plot, right? Indian burial ground type thing, which comes up a lot, you know, Stephen King type stuff, poltergeist, Jim Morrison seeing the spirits or whatever. Um, and then we have the bodies being buried in the ground. There's stuff buried underground, which is a reference to the triggers that uh, relate to each of the core person, the, the core altars here, right? Because spoiler alert, everybody in this film is an altar. And so what's weird is that this movie is told from the vantage point, not of the guy who has multiple personality, but from the vantage point of the altars in his head. So it's a very fascinating, unique take on this. Again, hearkening to books that we've covered, like Kurt Barker's book uh, on high-depth esoteric stuff or books that relate to uh, trauma-based mind control, uh, switching time. Uh, you've heard me reference that book many times. It's kind of like that. So we see the bodies buried in the ground. We see the connection to Florida, and everybody it turns out, oh, they all have the same birthday. They're all born on the same day. Why? Because their altars who were created, their splits created through trauma at a certain date, at a certain time uh, in the core personality's lifespan. And it turns out, of course, that the the kid, the least, the, the, the one that you least suspect, the little kid, is actually the core personality. And it turns out he's a serial killer who's on trial. And they're trying to determine, the judge is trying to determine if he's fit to go to trial or if he's actually insane. And so the question is, does the judge believe that he has alternate personalities, right? So all of that's very fascinating and you wouldn't immediately connect it to the question of trauma-based mind control, except that the doctor, when he's investigating the, the guy, actually says, quote, through trauma, split personality can happen, right? So he actually mentions trauma-based mind control. And so therefore we can see that this is actually a film that relates to um, themes that we've been covering lately, like Project Monarch, right? Which was part of MKUltra that dealt with actually trying to create and steer and control these kinds of personalities, dissociative states. Can, can you control them? So they're all born on the same day. They all relate back to Florida in some way because the core personality who is the kid, the serial killer, uh, that's where he's from, and and the hotel event was a traumatic experience period point in the, the child's life, right? So he was traumatized, neglected as a kid. He was neglected and abandoned, probably abandoned at that hotel, right? And so that's why these core personalities have developed in his head from this initial uh, trauma point. Uh, and so his mind has been fractured, it's been split, and so... Um, Presumably also there's some sense in which people that he's murdered are related to these people as well, right? So he's, he's killed many people, I think six or eight. Uh, and so these people also relate to the altars as well. But as we know, the kid is the core personality. And then the one stable personality that's left, the Amanda Pete character, you think she's going to be okay. You think she's gotten away uh, because he she's the last stable uh, character in his head as he's leaving the, the, the hospital, excuse me, the f correctional facility. Um, sh the, the boy comes to the fore and kills her. Right. So now the, the core personality who is the, uh, the psychopath is the last one that's left. So, uh, a lot of, a lot of points that do relate directly to all the stuff we talk about keys, triggers, uh, trauma based mind control splits, alters, um, and even a few references to philosophy and the esoteric. So if you've not seen Identity, I do recommend it. It is a movie relevant to the kind of analyses that we've been doing with Jamie and I doing the MK Ultra talk, uh, my analysis of Sons of the Lambs, for example. And so uh, after that, I, I mentioned around the same time the movie Butterfly Effect came out with Ashton Kutcher. And what's weird about Butterfly Effect is that it kind of has this facade of, of being about chaos theory right uh, if a butterfly flaps its wings in antarctica bro then it like affects ripple ripples in the uh, space-time fabric and that could change everybody's destiny that's just this nonsense theory of like the exact opposite of divine providence the most extreme opposite absurd view is that everything is just chaos right which if everything is chaos then you couldn't even make sentences right so there's this kind of overlay of chaos theory, which I guess has had varying levels of popularity in terms of uh, pop science, you know, the Bill Nye 
Neil McGrassy, Dick Tyson vein of things, right? Uh, I don't think it's as popular as it was in 2003 or four, whenever Butterfly Effect came out. But the idea here is not just that, but I think there's also chaos magic elements that are evident in this film. And so we see the beginning, the, the butterfly is the two hemispheres of the brain, the right and the left brain, right? And so that has, in many ways, in the, in the modern world, kind of been split. We are we are split between people who think that they're very intuitive, everything should be intuitive, or people who are left brain and they think that everything is purely quantitative, logical, rational analysis. And really, we're made to have both of those hemispheres of the brain working in tandem. I, I do think that that's true, even though a lot of people talked about that, a lot of goofy people talked about that. There's some truth to that, but uh, those two hemispheres will relate to the loosely speaking to Ashton Kutcher's character's dissociation. And so I think that even though it's presented as this sort of sci-fi alternate realities thing with chaos theory, it's more so about alternate realities like identity. Uh, in other words, alternate realities in the sense of alters in the mind, right? So he's seeing these different potential um, timelines that if he had done X, Y, Z act differently in the past, it would give him a new timeline, right? Like back to the future to Marty, Marty, right? Like Marty McFly and this is a timeline lecture from, from doc in back to the future Two, that kind of thing. But if we set that aside for a minute and then remember that the, the key event is the mm, creeper guy, uh, the creeper babysitter. By the way, why are you taking your kids to be babysat by this obviously creeper dude? Right? Like this boomer dad walking around with like whiskey in a in a glass. Hey, I'll take care of your kids. Yeah, come on down to my basement. Yeah, they'll be safe down here. Right. Just obvious red flags. Like what were the parents thinking, right? And so we find out that uh he's doing mm, creeper things. You, you, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And this leads to, I would say, alters, right? The daughter has been abused. The Ashton Kutcher guy, uh, uh, protagonist is abused. And so this leads to um, alternate ideas in the head right, of these people or alternate personas, MPD, DID, right? So that's what I kind of think is really going on here. Not so much a movie about alternate timelines, Marty McFly type stuff. It's kind of buried underneath there. Um and what it seems to focus on is the fact that the trauma relates to father figures, right? Now, it could relate to mother figures, but in this film, there's a lack of father figures. And so this pattern of the trauma being related to creating alternate personas and the repressed memories, right, coming forth relate to the father. So both Ashton Kutcher's dad and uh, his girlfriend, the girl that he likes, the, the dad that's the, the creeper, they're both father figures who ha have either failed or are trying to get their point across and the kids don't get it right. Ashton Kutcher's uh, dad is believed to be insane. He was studying psychology and uh, alternate personalities. And so uh, that's really what's going on in this movie. And it also reminded me of the film Rebel Without a Cause, which I'd never seen. I'd never seen a James Dean film. I know that's kind of embarrassing to be a Hollywood movie an analysisizer. And I've not seen that, but I went and watched that. And there was a very similar theme there. Now, it there actually is, if you remember the young the, the character, the kid named Plato. Plato is traumatized by his parents. And that's made very clear in the, in the film. He's abandoned. And he's triggered when they're at the abandoned mansion at the end of the film. And he goes on his crazed spree right and he, it's we it's crazy because he kind of prefigures a lot of events that we see with young people nowadays especially in the last 10 years rebel without a cause was way ahead of its time it was a, a pretty wild commentary on social events and what's the underlying factor of uh of the the protagonist the girl and the the young kid is that they all have absentee father figures right First and how love you. He plays the dad, right, uh, to to uh, James Dean, but he's a, a total beta dude, right? Like he fails at being a dad, and so it's the the same principle at work there. Even though the James Dean character is not doesn't have alternate persona personalities, right? The Plato, the kid, actually does, and that's what sends him on this trigger. He just loses it, and he goes goes nuts, right? 
And so you have the famous scene at the D.W. Griffith Observatory, which, by the way, is full of platonic elements. Plato, there's actually a, a big image of Plato there. And so the kid Plato runs to the observatory. It's very weird. That's a whole esoteric kind of hermetic uh, alchemical thing. That's If you've never been to the Griffith Observatory, I, I highly suggest going. And you'll notice all of the uh, esoteric stuff there alchemical stuff there in terms of the architecture and the imagery it's very blatant like it's not me that's not me speculating i've been there and seen it uh a couple years ago so um the repressed memories that relate to their dad uh they they are traumatized and then trigger things sort of bring this out and so these triggers which are in in butterfly effect going back to butterfly effect it's the diary right he's reading that diary and every time he reads that diary it, it triggers him out of that that alternate reality which as we said like identity is more so i would say like an alternate persona not a multiverse timeline so within this sci-fi story you kind of have this buried uh uh, idea of trauma-based mind control so another one that uh, honorable mention that maybe i'll do a separate stream on i should have included hide and seek in here because it's the exact same stuff uh, I'm not going to spoil hide and seek. Maybe I'll save uh, its own analysis uh, for for later on. But in hide and seek with Robert De Niro and Dakota Fanning, you have the exact same thing at work there. So once again, Hollywood is telling us way ahead of time what's really going on. And if you pay attention to the films, you have a better insight into reality, ironically, than if you're watching mainstream news. This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. Uh, leave me a comment. Tell me what I missed. I'm sure you guys, you guys are great. You always notice the stuff that I miss. So enlighten me below. And if you would, like and share this video. Uh, Much appreciated. You can also get my books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, which deal with these topics as well. 